Let's begin our discussion of the plasma membrane by talking about diffusion and osmosis. Diffusion is the movement of atoms, ions, or molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Due to the constant random motion of ions and molecules, chances are always greater that particles will move from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration when they are in solution. Going from high to low is also termed going down a concentration gradient. Take an example of a cube of salt being placed in a beaker of water. The cube represents where the salt is in high concentration, and the water surrounding the cube represents where the concentration of the salt is low. The salt will follow the law of diffusion and go from high to low until it has dispersed itself evenly throughout the beaker of water. Please remember what the law of diffusion is. Know that particles will always go from high to low. When we speak of diffusion, we are talking about small particles moving short distances. But here's a larger scale analogy that may help you understand diffusion. Your wonderfully awesome roommate is baking cookies in the kitchen. You are diligently studying for your upcoming physiology exam in the back bedroom of your apartment. Where are the cookies in highest concentration? In the kitchen, of course. Where are they low in concentration? In the bedroom. So ignoring air currents, the law of diffusion says that the cookie molecules will go from high to low and diffuse from the kitchen into the bedroom. There are several factors that influence the rate of diffusion. The biggest influence is the magnitude of the concentration gradient. What exactly is this? Simply put, the magnitude is the difference between the area of high concentration and the area of low concentration. If you have a large difference between the high and low, then the rate of diffusion will be fast. Conversely, if you have a small difference, the rate of diffusion will be slow. Here's another analogy. There is a car at the top of a hill. If you let it go, it will roll down the hill. To make it go faster down the hill, we could do one or both of two things. First, we could take it to the top of a higher hill and make the high higher. Or we could make the low lower and dig a big hole. Either way, we have made a bigger difference between the high and the low, and we could say we have increased the magnitude of the concentration gradient to make the car go faster down the hill. Another factor that influences the rate of diffusion is the temperature of the solvent. Increasing the temperature of the solvent that the solute diffuses through will increase the rate of diffusion. Imagine two beakers of water that both have salt added to them. One of the beakers is put over a flame, so the water is warmed up to a higher temperature. Higher temperatures mean that the molecules are moving faster, which allows diffusing particles to move faster through the solvent. Therefore, the salt in the beaker of warm water will diffuse faster. Also, the size of the diffusing molecules can influence the rate of diffusion. If the diffusing particles are smaller, it is less likely they will bump into another molecule. So they are less impeded and can diffuse faster. The viscosity or thickness of the solvent that the solute is diffusing through also makes a difference. Imagine if we added some liquid dye to a beaker of water the dye would go from high to low and diffuse throughout the beaker of water. But what if we change the solvent from water to something really thick like honey? Would the dye be able to diffuse throughout as quickly? No, because increased viscosity of the solvent slows the rate of diffusion. What about the term osmosis? Simply put, osmosis is the, the diffusion of water. As all molecules do, water also follows the law of diffusion and goes from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. Let's do a little experiment. Let's take a flask with a selectively permeable membrane and partially fill it with a 4% salt solution. Let's then place this flask into a beaker of distilled water. This membrane will only allow water to pass through it and not salt. Which direction do you think the water will diffuse? 
you know the answer because you know that the law of diffusion says that it will go from high to low. And distilled water is 100% water, so this is the area of high concentration for water. The salt water is partially composed of salt, so it's less than 100% water. So if you answer that the distilled water will move through the selectively permeable membrane and begin to enter into the salt water solution, then you are correct. The water column will rise until the driving osmotic force is equal to that of the weight of the water column in the opposite direction pulling the water down. The degree to which the water rises is determined by the magnitude of the concentration gradient. Could you change the magnitude of the concentration gradient in this example? You can't make the high any higher, since you can't concentrate water any more than distilled water, but you could make the low lower by concentrating the salt in the salt solution to decrease the concentration of water. If the salt solution was changed to a 10% salt solution, you would be changing the magnitude of the concentration gradient, and you would now have a greater force for water to enter the column, driving the column of water to a higher level. Let's do the same experiment, with a, but with a different container. Imagine if in this container one side contains distilled water, while the other side is filled with a 4% salt solution. The solutions are separated from one another by a selectively permeable membrane. This membrane will only allow water to pass through it and not salt. Which direction do you think the water will diffuse? You know the answer because you know that the law of diffusion says that it will go from high to low. Because distilled water is pure water, this is the area of high concentration. The salt water is partially composed of salt, so this is the area where the water is lower concentration. So if you answer that the distilled water will move through the selectively permeable membrane and begin to enter into the salt water solution, then you are correct. The water column will rise until the driving osmotic force is equal to that of the weight of the water column in the opposite direction, pulling the water down. The degree to which the water rises is determined by the magnitude of the concentration gradient. Could you change this magnitude of the concentration gradient? You can't make the high any higher, since you can't concentrate water any more than distilled water, but you could make the low lower by concentrating the salt in the salt solution to decrease the concentration of water. If the salt solution was changed to a 10% solution, you would be changing the magnitude of the concentration gradient, and you would now have a greater force for water to enter the column, driving the column of water to yet a higher level. Let's now apply what we've learned to body cells. Let's say you fall down and slash up your knee. You collect some of the blood and put some of the blood cells into a sink filled with tap water. Note that tap water has few ions in it, so it's almost 100% water. Also know that the solution inside red blood cells has a concentration of about 0.9% or 300 milliosmolar. Now there is a higher concentration of particles in the cells, so we say that the tap water is hypotonic compared to the solution inside the cells. Now also knowing that the cell membrane is selectively permeable and only lets water cross, not the solute particles, you have to decide which direction the water would diffuse. Remember the law of diffusion. Water will go from high to low. Water concentration is highest in the tap water, so it would go from high to low and enter the cells, making the cells get larger and maybe even breaking the cells. This breaking of the cells is called cytolysis. Cyto means cell, and lysis means break. Now say instead of tap water, we put red blood cells into a concentrated solution, like that of the Great Salt Lake, which can be 10% or higher. In this case, there is a higher concentration of solute particles outside the cell. So the solution is considered to be hypertonic compared to the solution inside the cell. Now the water would go the opposite direction because the water is in highest concentration in the cell and lower in the surrounding water. 
the water would go from high to low and leave the cell, causing it to shrink, or what's called crenate. Another way to remember which direction water would go is to remember that it will always go where there are more solute particles or more salt. It's only if we put it into an isotonic solution, iso means same, that would result in the same amount of water leaving the cell as enters, resulting in no change in size of the cell. An isotonic solution would have a concentration of about 300 milliosmolar. Let's apply what we've learned. What would happen to a person's cells if you gave them a 10% sodium chloride solution intravenously? Water would go from high to low, or you could remember it would go where there's more salt. Remembering that the concentration in red blood cells is 0.9% or 300 milliosmolar, we know that water would leave the cells and cause them to crenate. Alternatively, what would happen if you gave straight water in the IV? The water would enter the cells and possibly cause them to lyse. You can see that the tonicity of the solution that cells are placed in is critical for cell survival. There was a case in 2006 where a little girl received an IV in the hospital before her cancer treatments, but instead of an isotonic solution, the hospital pharmacy accidentally added way too much salt to the IV solution they prepared for her. It was actually a 23% sodium chloride solution. All the water began leaving the red blood cells in her blood. She immediately complained of thirst. She became severely dehydrated and unfortunately did not survive. Now you know why it's important to administer IV solutions that don't cause the cells to crenate or lyse. One last important concept. You may be familiar with the term hydrophilic to describe molecules. Hydrophilic means water-loving. Hydrophilic molecules, you might guess, mix well with water. Hydrophobic molecules, on the other hand, are molecules that hate water. These molecules do not mix well with water. Please remember that molecules or substances that are charged mix well with water. This includes ions and sugar molecules that, can, that contain partial charges. Hydrophobic molecules include lipids because the structure of a lipid does not have a charge or a partial charge. This is because lipid molecules are mostly made up of carbon atoms attached to hydrogen atoms and are called hydrocarbons. Hydrophobic molecules tend to mix well with lipids and not water. Please join us now for part two of this video series. Thanks for watching.